Welcome to OVA Hour. Um, I'm Jennifer Garrison. I'm a faculty member here at the Buck Institute. Um, I'm also a co-founder and director of the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality at the Buck Institute. So Buck has been pioneering this movement uh, to globally to advance scientific research that's focused on reproductive aging in women. Um, we think this is really important because reproductive decline in midlife is about a lot more than just fertility or menopause. It's something that impacts every woman's entire life experience, um, her career, her family, her overall health and well-being. We think about this as an issue of equality. And this is an area of science that has historically been overlooked by funding agencies. And so um, there's a huge opportunity for scientists working in this space to understand how and why ovaries in women age prematurely, right? Ovaries start to age long before the rest of the body. And at the Buck Institute, we're focused on trying to understand mechanisms of aging so that we can slow it down um, and extend the number of years that someone is healthy, so extend health span. So through funding, collaboration, and innovation, uh, the Global Consortium is trying to accelerate the pace of discovery in this space. Um, and as we're building this ecosystem, I get to talk to really exciting and interesting people every day, from clinicians to early stage biotech founders, amazing scientists, entrepreneurs. And this OVA Hour webinar is my opportunity to introduce you to them. So today I'm especially delighted to have two guests with us. Uh, Francesca Duncan is um, an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the Feinberg School of Medicine uh, at Northwestern University. She also happens to be the executive director of the Center for Reproductive Science at Northwestern. Um, Francesca is also a founding member of the Buck Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, uh, which we'll get into later. Uh, Francesca has been in the field for, of reproductive science for 20 years, for her entire career. Um, and her lab is using mammalian models to study how changes in pathways inside eggs and outside of the eggs in the ovarian microenvironment contribute to reproductive age-associated decline. Um, so she's really working at the interface of reproductive aging and systemic aging. Um, and she has won many, many awards and honors. I won't go through all of them, um, but she was a Fulbright Fellow in 2017. Um, and in 2019, she won the Society for the Study of Reproduction Varenda B. Mahesh New Investigator Award. So welcome, Francesca. Um, we're also, oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> um, we're also really fortunate to have Julia Below, who is the operations leader for our reproductive biology hub here at the Buck Institute, which we'll also talk more about in a bit. Um, and she's, ten, she's also a member of the Duncan Lab, so she works with Francesca every day. Um, and Julia is both a talented embryologist, um, but also an amazing collaborator and an amazing teacher. So welcome, Julia. Thank you. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> what um, kind of introductions. Thank you so much for having us. We're so thrilled to be here. Yeah, um, we all wanna hear about the science that you guys are doing. Um, but I thought this would be a really good opportunity for us to talk about the fields of female reproductive aging um, to think to really bring our our viewers in to understand um, where it was before, say, 2019, where it's at right now and what what our vision is for where it's going in the future. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover. And I want to start by, um, you know, basically framing this historic view of the field. So I met Francesca a few years ago when we were recruiting new faculty for the Buck Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, which was made possible through a really um, generous donation um, by the Bia Echo Foundation and the Sergei Brin Family Foundation. And they were, I would say, prescient in understanding that this is a really important problem that hasn't received enough attention. Um, and Francesca, we hired you as a professor in residence, which I think a lot of people won't, won't understand what that means, but essentially you have a footprint, a lab at, at Northwestern University, but you also have left the Buck Institute. Um, and that setup is you know, kind of a way for us to allow maximum collaboration and an opportunity to work together across multiple institutions to push things forward faster. So um, as one of the people who has uh, been in this field for your entire career, um, and I keep saying that because it's rare, right? 
when I came to this space a few years ago, my background is obviously in neuroscience and in aging. Um, you know, there we just we, there weren't as many scientists as we thought there should be working uh, on female reproductive aging. Plenty of people working on aging biology, plenty of people working on reproductive science, um, but very few <clears throat> really um, straddling both both areas. Um, really bridging both disciplines. So how did you get interested in female reproductive aging so early in your career? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I'm, I will talk about that. But I also want to just come back to that point that I want to make sure that we touch upon is sort of why are there so few people who were studying, you know, reproductive aging or this topic. And so if I don't address that and sort of telling you my path, let's come back to it, because I think it's a really important point, And I think it's why um, organized movements like what the buck has done has been really important for the field. So just to give you a little bit of background, so I am an egg biologist by training. Um, when I started my PhD, I was really interested in how two single cells, like the sperm and the egg, can come together and create an organism that's billions of cells itself. Like that was just mind boggling to me and it still is mind boggling to me. Um, but as I've been getting older, um, I've been starting to become more interested in why this egg that has so much potential energy to make an entirely new organism is also one of the cells that ages, one of the first to age in the human body. So tremendous potential for life, but also um, deteriorates really rapidly. And so we know this from the concept of female reproductive aging, which you mentioned, the female reproductive system is really the first to age in the human body. Um, and this is really characterized by two main um, events. One is the loss of the number of eggs that are in the ovary or the follicles that are in the ovary. Um, and then this is also accompanied by a deterioration in the quality of the eggs that remain in that ovary. Um, and so I became really interested in how this process was happening. And for me, you know, I'm a basic scientist, so I like to look at inside the cell and understand mechanisms, but I don't like to just study something, you know, for the sake of studying it. I want to study something that has a wor real world, you know, implications and that we can do something about it. And so when I was talking to my mentors, they were always telling me like study robust phenotypes, which means study something that is very reproducible happens all the time. Like you don't wanna study something that happens some of the time and you have to kind of squint to see an effect. That's um, good advice. Yeah, it's a good advice for anything. But so female reproductive aging really was this robust phenomenon that happens because it's gonna to happen to every single woman no matter where she lives on the globe. Um, and that's gonna happen very reproducibly. So the age of menopause has, has you know, stayed constant around age 50 for, for centuries. Um, and, and the quality of the eggs begins to decline much earlier. So in women who are in their mid thirties. And so this has a lot of implications clinically because if egg quality is declining in women in their thirties, and we know that you know, women are delaying childbearing for many, many different reasons, this means that women of advanced reproductive age are going to start experiencing infertility. But we also know that the eggs are producing really important hormones in the ovary, like estrogen. And estrogen is really important for regulating bone health, um, immune health, sexual health, so many different sort of general health outcomes. And so while menopause is not a pathology, it's not a disease, it's normal aging, um, the fact that we are with medical interventions living much longer, our lifespan in women are now, is in the US is now heading up towards 80 years of age. That means that women are living longer in this altered endocrine environment. And so all of a sudden this sort of very reproducible phenomenon in the biology of the aging egg has really important societal implications. And so that was enough of a sort of motivation for me to wake up every day, get into the lab and do research to understand this mechanism. So you bring up a good point is that there aren't, there weren't a lot of people who were studying the aging of the egg. And I happened to be working in a lab that um, was studying DNA chromosomes. And we know that with age, there is um, an increase in chromosomal abnormalities in the egg. And one of the sort of common manifestations is the increase in Down syndrome uh, that happens when women of advanced reproductive age. And so I was really focused on understanding why these chromosomes are not separating appropriately in the egg and that you end up with extra chromosomes and eggs from older women. Um, and so that became sort of my focus, but there weren't a ton of people who were studying just aging in general. 
And I think this brings up sort of two points and, you know, I would love to kind of hear your thoughts and, um, you know, if this sort of resounds with you as well. But I think one of the things is that, you know, the field of aging and the field of reproductive science are not enormous fields. Um, they're really important fields, but if you compare it to sort of cancer um, as a field, it's just, it's a much smaller field. And so reproductive aging is a subset of an already small discipline. So that's like one thing is that there's just not a lot of people in general when you can look at all scientists. I think the other major thing um, is that, um, Again, age, this aging has happened in young women, right? In a chronologically young individual. Most people would say someone in their 30s is young. And I think from the aging perspective and even just general society, when we think about aging, we're thinking about, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. And so the conversations just were not happening between these two disciplines because of that chronologic divide. Um, and so, yes, there are a handful of people who are studying this topic in very sort of focused manners, but it wasn't a discussion that we were having on a larger scale. Um, and so I think that, you know, we're trying to really understand what's, what's happening sort of earlier on before this larger movement. And actually, I'm, I just want to kind of turn it to Jules quickly, because what she's doing is um, really doing a review of the scientific literature to figure out um, what have we known about reproductive aging and we're particularly interested in what we've learned from model organisms like animal models um, and particularly mouse models of reproductive aging and I think her work does kind of point to the fact that the field certainly existed right okay. so um, Jules you can maybe talk a little bit about what you found in terms of sort of the number of the papers and historically um, but I think then we can come back to that topic of like, why? Why has yeah. it taken this you know, long to get to the, you know, uh, a coalesced movement? Mm -hmm. Sure, thanks. Um, so yes, we dove in the, into the literature to try to understand what is known about reproductive aging in a female system um, and how has it been studied, particularly in animal models. Um, and so we just started looking at key words like reproduction, like animal models to see what we could pull from scientific uh, literature. And we actually reviewed over 7,000 citations and these dated back over 60 to 70 years. From that, we were able to pull uh, close to 230, uh, I believe it was 230 citations that were specific to reproductive age endpoints in a female model. When and you say citations, just for the non-scientists um, who might be listening, um, can you can you expand on what you mean by that? Absolutely. So the way, you know, a lot of the way we communicate science is through talking, right? But in order to publish results and publish the science and the research that we we observe in our laboratory, we write up scientific articles and papers. So when we talk about a citation, this is linking to a specific research article that has been published and is accessible to anybody who wants to look at it, um, usually through scientific databases. So when we write these reviews in the field, really the goal of a, of a review is to, you know, ask a singular question and go, okay, in the history of, of science that has been published, how many people have looked at this and what can we learn from this question? So our question was, what, can, what is known about female reproductive aging when studied in an animal model? And we looked at all publications from all time. Um, and oh. so our earliest publications uh, dated back to the 1950s, actually. And these were really early characterizations of the estrus cycle, so the hormone cycle in the mouse. Um, and so going to what Francesca is saying, within reproduction, people who study reproduction, of course we're aware of the age of our model systems, because at some point we can no longer study reproduction because these models will no longer produ reproduce. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the aging field, exactly what Francesca is saying, you're looking at an aged individual where the assumption is reproduction has long since stopped. So there really is this disconnect between a reproductively young, or I'm sorry, a reproductively aged individual is in a completely different chronologic stage compared to an aging individual traditionally. And so this... Yeah. And so this, um, this review is characterizing everything we know, and what we can show is that the field has existed for, you know, close to 70 years because people are publishing, answering questions pertaining to female reproductive aging, and that's what this review is uh, really summarizing. And it's, 
you know, um, what Francesca was saying, traditionally, we think of this as an egg issue about quality and uh, quantity of eggs. But really what our review is showing is that it's a lot larger, a more reproductive tissues, cells and organs are impacted with age. So it's not singularly focused just on the egg. This extends to other parts of the body as well. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I can't wait to read that review. Uh, when's it coming out? <laughs> we are in the... Go ahead. Hopefully, yeah, I was going to say, hopefully in early 2022. So we'll definitely make sure to share that with the community because I think it's an interesting exercise and in that question of like, where was the field? Where has the field been and where is it now? Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that we saw in this review, which again, it's it's a simple question, right? Like it's not a complex question. It's just what is what has been published in the field over time? And what we see is there's this exponential increase in the number of publications in this area um, with really a, a one big jump happening in 2010, which I have some thoughts on why that is, but then also you know, continuing to rise, which I think brings up this point of where we are now. Um, mm -hmm. I will just, you know, we've talked about this, Jen, a lot um, about these kind of two fields coming together. So before we get into like the now and what happened, what is this sort of paradigm shift? I do want to just talk about it from the perspective of being a young investigator. So when oh, I, yeah. so again, I was um, starting, I was doing my postdoctoral training. So I had my PhD, I was getting into this concept of aging in the egg. Um, and I was starting to think about running my own research lab. And so I was, again, really fascinated by the cell with so much potential energy, but then it ages so quickly. And I was thinking, well, how can I, how can I start thinking about how to run a research program for 10 years, you know, a 10, 20, 30 year research program with innovative ideas. And so, you know, our fields like reproductive science and aging have really important um, training classes. And at the time, um, there was a course called Molecular Biology of Aging um, that was held at the Marine Biological Laboratory of Woods Hole. Mm -hmm. And I had taken some classes there on reproductive science. And so I knew kind of that how great those courses were because you go there for several weeks and like immerse yourself in a discipline and you get it's to- It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And, you it's know, really I teach in the neurobiology course and we're yeah. trying to restart that aging course, I will say. So yeah, 2023. We, need, we yeah. need to restart the aging course, but- but you get to go and immerse yourself with a discipline and with like peers and leaders in the field and start thinking about how they think. And I actually have to say that before this, I had spent my entire career avoiding anything that was outside of reproduction. Like if a seminar was coming in and someone was talking about something that wasn't reproduction, I was like, I don't need to know this. It's not relevant. Um, and this course, like diving into this just completely changed the trajectory of my career. So I was embedded, like this reproductive scientist embedded in a group of 20, so 19, because there were 20 of us total, um, and they were aging researchers, sort of burgeoning aging researchers. And I remember the first day when we were doing introductions and I, you know, I said what I studied, they all sort of looked at me like, you, what does this have to do with aging? Like, again, this is happening in women in their 30s, that's not aging. And so I really sort of felt you know, it took a while to convince people and, and to educate and to have these conversations of like, yes, it's not an old individual, but the cell itself is undergoing these aging processes. Um, so I think that was super interesting in terms of starting that dialogue, but, and I met people in the field. I think I told you that I still have my notebook from there. And, and I had written sort of, I, that was when I first heard Judy Campisi, who's at the mm -hmm. Buck talking about her work on cellular senescence. And I thought like light bulbs went out. No one's looking at these concepts, these aging concepts in our system. Yeah. Here's my 10 year plan of how to run a research program. And so that's what I ended up doing. But I was from 2013 until I met you in 2018, I was somewhat working in a vacuum. Again, not to say that the field didn't exist, not to say that there hasn't been tremendous discoveries since then, Absolutely. but yeah. the dialogue was very, um, sort of contained. And yeah, it's I been think, really siloed, I think. Right, like fragmented and mm -hmm. really good work, but there wasn't ever a mechanism or a platform to be able to, you know, bring it all together and make really forward momentum. And I think that's where, um, I think that's where sort of that timing of 2018 is really critical in terms of a really big shift in both the fields of aging and reproduction. Um, and I think for me, that that class in the MBL in 2013 was the beginning, the beginning of those bridges 
and those discussions across the disciplines and starting to bring aging concepts to a field in a totally new way. I mean, in a way you were like a pioneer, um, but also I imagine felt a lot like an oddball. Um, I think the aging, from the aging science perspective, certainly I still have to explain to people why you know, aging and reproductive organs, which happens so much earlier is relevant. Um, and it is very important, right? The age at which a woman goes through menopause um, is related to her overall uh, lifespan. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, basically bringing the theories of aging into your sphere of ovarian biology, um, it sounds like, yeah, you were the pioneer there and now we're trying to, to to bring sort of the ovarian biology and, and what's happening on that side, really educate aging researchers as well and build these bridges. Um, as a young investigator, you probably didn't have a lot of credibility to say like, this is important. Um, and I would add to you know, the list of things you mentioned uh, in terms of why you know, this incredibly interesting area of science has remained relatively understudied. Um, I, I think that just women's health in general and anything related to women's health has been uh, largely ignored by the biomedical research community. Not so much in the past 10 years, but you know, I, I think that there was a history there. Um, and funding bodies, you know, I, I think there are a couple of places um, at the National Institutes of Health where we go for aging research grants and where you go for reproductive science grants, um, but there hasn't really been, you know, a cohesive funding body that, that has, you know, historically said, yes, this is important. We want to give money to this. And as a scientist, obviously, you know, we can't work on problems unless uh, we have money to do that. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think that there has been a shift um, and I, you know, when I think you talked about sort of the 10, the 10% effort that I have in the Buck Institute and this assistant professor in residence um, position. And I think, you know, I was, I, I'm at Northwestern in the department of OBGYN and, and had an established lab there. And I was not looking for a position when the Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality was launched. And I think we should talk a little bit about sort of that movement. But for me, again, with my research, interest, this was an opportunity um, in a completely unprecedented way to, to, it was a dream. Like if this job, you know, if the center had been developed in 2013, this would have been exactly what I was looking for. Um, and so I think that ability to bring the worlds together is something that the center has, has really enabled. And we're seeing that mirrored, not only at the center at the buck, but these shifts in funding agencies and these opportunities and, and, and sort of this broader understanding, even society, you know, we see in the lay public in the press, we see a lot of coverage of this topic. So, um, you know, I think, I think now is sort of the time to be having these conversations. Um, and so I don't, maybe you can talk a little bit about maybe from your perspective to kind of, we can start shifting in the paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. um, like, I'm curious actually just to kind of, hear your perspective of what happened, how did you get involved? So how did, how did this kind of topic come and what was your initial impression and, and why did you sort of change your focus and really come behind this? And I think maybe that can start sort of, we can go back and forth about um, that paradigm shift and what we're experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. It's so exciting um, what's happening right now. So I, you know, I came to aging research uh, relatively late. Uh, I trained as a cell biologist, uh, a synthetic organic chemist, and, and then a neuroscientist. And the area of neuroscience that I'm passionate about is trying to understand how the brain communicates with the rest of the body. And the reason that I jumped into aging research when I started my lab was because there's this whole class of chemicals that the brain uses to do what is essentially like Wi-Fi signaling, right? So basically the brain talking to the rest of the body without actually you know, having physical connections to the rest of the body. And I think, you know, I'm biased obviously, but I think that changes 
in those signaling molecules with age and changes in the, the signaling pathways that they control, that that is one of the, the major um, causes of systemic aging. And so it was just a natural fit for the, the research that I wanted to do to come to the Buck Institute. And so as part of one of the projects in my lab, we were studying one of these signaling molecules. It's a neuropeptide called oxytocin. And we figured out that it has a role in aging. And we were looking at mechanism. We were trying to figure out, okay, like we know it's doing something, but how is it doing what it's doing with respect to aging? And that brought us to the reproductive system. <laughs> and so, and the timing was really uh, fortunate um, at that moment that the project was sort of going in that direction. That's when uh, Nicole Shanahan came to the Buck Institute and gave us this incredible gift um, that started that launched the center. Mm -hmm. um, so I was asked to be on the steering committee uh, to hire new faculty to, to launch the center. That's how I met you, Francesca. That's how I met everyone, actually. And um, I, you know, I, I got really excited and um, I spent a lot of time learning about the field, both for my own research, but also because once I started diving into the questions, it's so compelling. I mean, from the perspective of, of wanting to understand aging, just, you know, knowing finding out what are the causal factors or cues or constellation of cues and factors that so, as you said, reproducibly cause ovaries to start declining in a woman in her late 20s, early 30s. If we can figure that out, I think that that will go a long way towards giving us a clue about what's happening in terms of aging in the rest of the body. So I think that's, that's crucial. But, you know, once we started thinking about it from the perspective of um, society, you know, stepping back from the biology and the science and just coming to understand that the fact that women go through this reproductive decline in midlife, it really does have an impact on her entire world, right? Uh, if, if a woman is lucky enough to make it to midlife, she absolutely will go through menopause, right? It's like death, you can't escape it. So, you know, the, the, as you mentioned, the, the negative health consequences of losing those hormones that the ovary produces, um, combined with the fact that, you know, like the vasomotor symptoms that are associated with that, um, you know, hot flashes and brain fog and, you know, just all of these things that, that can really dramatically impact a woman's quality of life. All of those things are happening at the moment when most women are reaching the pinnacle of their careers. And so, you know, thinking about it from the perspective of just, this is not fair. <laughs> and men don't have to go through this. That provided a lot of a lot of motivation uh, for me to try to build the build the field. Um, and I will say, you know, we we launched the center, and um, we've had uh, Dina Amira as a guest on the OVA Hour. Um, she's a member of the center and an evolutionary biologist. Um, hopefully, we'll have Polina Lishko on as well. But when we launched the center in uh, was it late 2019? Uh, it was maybe it was 2018. Gosh. The pandemic. the pandemic has really um, ruined my memory. Time seems very fluid. But, you know, when we when we launched the center, um, we started immediately with collaborations internally and externally at the Buck. Um, the, the vision for the center was truly to take reproductive biologists, um, people like you who have a, a already established interest in aging, but then also to bring in people who maybe like Polina, who hadn't thought about aging before, um, and to put them in this community where there are aging scientists working on really every aspect of organismal aging down to you know molecular aging, and to have this cross-pollination of ideas and collaborations and just to sort of jumpstart the field organically that way. And once we once we did that, it became apparent that there was an opportunity to make a much bigger impact. Um, and that's where the global consortium came in. So while the center is an internal thing that exists at the Buck Institute, the consortium was meant to um, take what we were doing at Buck and try to extend it outward to the rest of the world. Because like you mentioned, there are scientists all over the place who are working on this. They're just working, you know, in isolation or, you know, there's not a, a, a real network or an ecosystem 
of support um, that exists. And so that's where the consortium came in. And again, this was a really generous donation from uh, the Biaco Foundation. And what we do at the consortium is essentially to give away grants. We recognize that, that problem, that fundamental problem of, of a lack of funding in the space. And so we give away grants to scientists who are working on these problems. Um, and then the, of course, the, the secondary part of that is to build out this network. And part of what we wanted to do, because we want to attract as many creative people as we can to, to turn their attention to this area, um, we, we had this idea to open a reproductive biology core facility, which, you know, as a scientist, I rely on core facilities for lots of things, um, my microscopy, my sequencing. Um, there are facilities that, that do something that I personally, in my lab, maybe I'm not an expert in, but that I need to do those things in order to, to, to complete my projects. So the Reproductive Biology Hub, which is what Jules leads, um, is essentially designed to lower the barrier to entry for people coming from outside so that they can um, you know, learn and collaborate on projects that are around ovarian biology, right? When I started a few years ago, I had no idea how to work with ovaries, <laughs> like none at all. And I would say I'm still a novice, although people in my lab are now, I think, expert. Um, but you know, it's kind of daunting as a scientist to, to think about moving into a new area that you're not familiar with or that you don't have a huge amount of uh, experience or expertise in. Um, so the Reproductive Biology Hub is, um, you know, it's meant to enable people to, to work on this, uh, on this area of science if they're interested. Jules, do you want to talk about the hub? Absolutely, sure. Um, so exactly what Jennifer was saying, in, in science and in, in institutions that do a lot of science and research, we rely on core facilities. And really these facilities house a specialized technique or, or instrument that might be too expensive for an individual lab to use, or there just really isn't a feasible way to have that in-house. And so in institutions, right, they'll, they'll have these resources available to different investigators um, to use to, to ask and answer specific questions. And so that was really the way this was pitched, right? We'd like to do this for reproduction. But something that's really interesting is, you know, in reproduction, this is an entire field, right? It's not a specific technique or instrument. We can't supply that. But what we're really doing and what we've created is this intellectual hub where we have individuals who have an interest in ovarian aging, or maybe they don't, but they have a really interesting model. And this model stops breeding, or this model doesn't survive past a certain uh, age or date. And so they'll come to us and say, we're seeing something happening with our animals. We don't know exactly how, you know, how to investigate this question. Can you help us design something? So really what we do in the hub is just exactly uh, what Jennifer said, this is basically a space where we've embedded reproductive scientists within an aging community. And so we will, so investigators will come to us with a question, with a problem, with an animal, with tissues and say, what can we learn about this? And so we do a lot of um, consultation and designing of experiments to investigate reproductive questions. So this could be looking at the ovarian reserve. So this is the number of, of eggs that make up basically the lifespan of the ovary. And this is a finite amount of, of eggs that's within the oocyte that declines with age. And so in certain instances, this might be an accelerated process or maybe there's something that can maintain this. And so the benefit about being in, a, in an aging institution is these aging scientists are, are doing an incredible job at extending lifespan. They're doing an incredible job of identifying anti-aging therapeutics and identifying genetic markers and biomarkers to look at um, that may have a role in aging. And we ask the question, okay, what if we take that model or take that, that marker and look at it in the ovary? The ovary is the first organ to age. And if we can delay that aging, not only can we preserve fertility for women, but we can delay menopause, which is gonna, uh, in turn, extend female reproductive lifespan in general. And also, you know, I think one thing we want to talk about is for the longest time, when you think about reproduction, you think solely about fertility. And I think one of the reasons why there's been a lot more attention on this is because people are now understanding and we're talking a lot more about, you know, the egg. Yes, it's important to create the next generation, but it also is important and is involved in creating 
hormones that have systemic effects on other organ systems. And so this does have a, a general health implication as well. So we in the hub do a lot of, of um, consultation. We take, we answer a lot of questions. I do a lot of training. And so essentially people will come to us and they'll go, okay, I'd like to involve a reproductive scientist in this question. Or we have trainees who are really interested in looking at reproductive systems in their own science. And so I do a lot of training on, on you know, ovary dissection, looking at different techniques that are specific to the reproductive system. So Jules, I think you said that beautifully, eloquently. Um, I just want to pick up on two points that came up like as you were talking. Right. So certainly we, I would actually say that we have fewer people who say I have a reproductive phenotype um, or endpoint, like we have infertility in our animals. We have, I mean, I think that that's clearly a case where someone is going to come to us. I think that the even bigger impact is we have people who never thought to look at the ovary ever. Right, um, people who, who like just threw the ovaries away at the end of yeah, their Yeah, and I think something even more important is that people who never have studied female mice. So mm -hmm. this is a really big problem in general. And I think Jennifer, you brought this up in the, the point of sort of women's health in general. So from a basic science perspective, you know, for, for many years, up until just a few years ago, there wasn't a requirement to look at, you know, biology in the two different sexes. It wasn't a requirement to have males and females in studies. And it's only recently where um, you have to actually do that or state explicitly on your NIH grants, like why you're not studying the two different sexes. Um, right. And in a lot of these studies, the female animals have always been sort of thought to be pesky because they have these, you know, estrus cycles, they have hormones that confound results. And so many, many studies have been based off of work that's done exclusively in male animals. So yeah. I think by, you know, have been actually physically embedded within the Buck Institute and this really rich, rich science is happening in aging, we're able to say, okay, if you have female animals, that you're going to throw out the ovaries, just give them to us and let us see what's there. Let us do a few sort of rounds of, of basic characterization to say, is there something there? I think there is, but it's a win-win, right? So it's not just that, that as reproductive scientists, we are giving to the aging community. It's also, again, that the aging community is informing us. So I have thought about mechanisms that are of aging in the ovary that are completely things that I never would have thought about um, and looking at different endpoints. And I think the other thing to think about is how we analyze our model systems. So as reproductive scientists, we're looking at ovarian function. We're looking at hormone levels. But what are true aging endpoints um, to evaluate the health of these animals? Um, and so I think we're learning a lot about, you know, it's not just the ovary at the end of the day or just the reproductive system, um, but what are these overall health parameters? What should we be looking at? And what are the crosstalk with other organ systems that are aging or like the brain, that communication? So I think it's definitely a learning experience for all of us, but I, in just the two years that we've been there, and again, within the middle of the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. but our lessons learned have been tremendous and the types of collaborations that we've been able to make and the types of research that would never have happened before um, are happening because of this sort of thinking outside of the box that, that was set up through the GCRLE and the CRLE. Yeah, it's been amazing. I mean, we could talk about this all day. Uh, we did a whole OVA webinar on um, the role of uh, <laughs> that women's health and and the the uh, the way that biomedical research has ignored it. So um, we won't spend too much more time on that. But I, I think it's really key to point out that even for scientists who are including females in their studies, um, you know, even when I inc was including female mice in, in our, our work, I never thought to look at the ovaries, never, never. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's really, it's a really amazing advance just to have everyone at the buck who has an animal model of aging, to have them now interested and collaborating to look at what's happening in the ovaries because um, it's, it's so connected. So when in I, terms of, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, before we kind of dive into the, the sort of the collaborations and things, which mm -hmm. I'm happy to talk about. I mean, I do think we're at this fulcrum right now where we have the opportunity to, to change the framework in which we think about aging, especially for women. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I was taking the course at the Marine Biological Laboratory, one of the sort of the concepts that had been coming up around that time was that 
in aging research, it had always been about sort of lifespan. So like living longer, but at that mm -hmm. time, really the concept that was coming up to the forefront was health span. So living longer in a healthier state. And I think where we are now is that discussion really needs to be added a third layer on top of that, that when you're dealing, especially with women, that health span within health span is reproductive span. Um, mm -hmm. And that health span of fertility and endocrine health, you can't have health span in women without those things being considered. And so That's now- That's exactly with, right. Yeah, so like now that there's you at the table, me at the table, and you know all of the people who are in our fields at the table, I think that's going to be really important. And I think that's really important in general because we're seeing aging as a priority in a lot of places. So I know you're probably, I think you're involved in the national academies, like the longevity um, initiative. We see that there are lots of aging institutes setting up in universities, um, in industries and in femtech, like all of these things, there's just a push towards aging research in general. And so I think it's really important that we advocate um, that that reproductive longevity is, is part of that just broad discussion. And so I do think that sort of now is, you know, comparing 2013 to now, like we're at the time where we can have these discussions and when we can make sure that, you know, reproductive longevity and equality is, is globally considered um, in discussion yeah. with aging. Yeah, there's definitely, there's a renaissance yeah. going on. And, and this is part of the, you know, when I talk to people about the consortium, they focus in immediately on the granting, which is obviously super important, but building the network um, and, and including, you know, conversations um, between not just scientists and clinicians, but between other stakeholders who would normally not talk to each other. Um, you know, I, I spend so much time talking to, as you said, early stage uh, biotech founders and investors who are coming into this space. And um, you're right, this is dovetailed with a real, I would say, uh, an explosion in the aging research space over the last five to 10 years, where before, like you said, aging was really a, a niche field. And now it's become so clear that you know, aging is the number one risk factor for every disease of the modern world. And so if we can tackle aging, and that does not mean, obviously, just I'll say it just so that everyone is on the same page, that does not mean that we want to increase lifespan to be you know, 300. We wanna keep lifespan steady. And what we wanna do is compress that period of time at the end of life when age-related diseases happen, right? So basically to be as healthy as you can for as long as you can, that's what health span is. But you're right, health span and reproductive span are intimately linked. And while we've, we're extending healthy longevity, right? There's, there's been a huge amount of progress in aging research. While we extend healthy longevity, if we don't address reproductive longevity, then we're making gender inequality worse, not better. And that's because as a, the age at menopause stays steady, you know, soon women are going to be living more of their lives in this, in this mm -hmm. compromised health state um, than before. And, and that's something that I think we, we should not tolerate and we, sh we can change. So that, that's one of the things that I think really motivates us on the consortium side. When I also think sort of on the research side, I mean, we have, we have some solutions, right, to be able to combat reproductive aging. So from a fertility standpoint, there's assisted reproduction. And then for the menopausal symptoms, there is hormone replacement therapy. But these are, these are Band-Aid solutions, right? It's, and what we really want to do is, is preserve the ovarian function that is there. And, you know, something that I, I don't think maybe everyone realizes is that we're born, women are born with a million follicles, a million eggs, but only 400 of those eggs will be ovulated over time. And so there's a huge amount of waste that's happening in that ovary. And if we could somehow prevent those follicles from deteriorating in number and in quality, we could preserve that reproductive longevity to do exactly what you said, not to make women pregnant at 70 or for people to live to 300 years old, but to live a longer, healthier life. And so the fact that this ovary has this million of primordial follicles in the ovary, that gives us hope that there are ways of strategies that we can use to extend that reproductive longevity. I also think there's you know, more that we can learn here. So is the ovary a canary in the mine? 
it ages before other organ systems. Mm -hmm. um, can we understand aging in that ovary and ex extrapolate that into mechanisms of aging in other tissues? Or can we use markers of ovarian aging to predict aging in other organ systems? So I think mm -hmm. there's just tremendous opportunity for us. And it's gonna take centuries for us to answer these questions, which means we're gonna be in business for a really long time. <laughs> and I think that this, these discussions have just catalyzed all of these areas, which I might've been thinking about them in my office by myself, <laughs> but without a field that's mobilized and you know, all the way from laboratories up to policymakers, like we're now poised to put all of this into action. So I think it's a super exciting time. And that's why I was just beyond thrilled um, to hear about your efforts with the CRLE, with the GCRLE, and to be able to be involved um, in this conversation. Um, because again, I just can't emphasize how unprecedented these times are. And to see two fields come together to tackle a problem. I mean, I think that's extraordinarily rare um, for disciplines to come together. And the, the amount of sort of activation energy, because we have to learn to speak our language. Yeah. Um, and, you know, aging researchers and reproductive scientists, they do science differently. Mm -hmm. You know, they have different standards, they have different ways of interpreting. So it has been a learning curve in terms of communicating across the sides, but I just think it's absolutely awesome and fascinating and exciting. Yeah, it's amazing. And we're so, we're so fortunate and so happy um, to have you uh, at the buck, uh, at least for some of your time. Um, so I guess, Jules, I want to bring you back into the conversation. <laughs> you should chime in because I know that you probably have a lot to say on these topics too. Yeah, I did want to mention that just along these lines, um, you know, this is extremely important for, right, 50% of the population, every female on the planet. But just like what Francesca was saying, really the spark of this is you have these two functional cells that come together and create something else that will be billions of cells, and that will be in its own person eventually, right? And so when you think about, you have these cells that are accumulating damage over time, and then we're going to use them to create a new organism. And so what's the impact? Yes, we're having an impact on the individual female level, but these materials that are aging are going to be used to create another individual. So as the average age of first time mothers and fathers is increasing globally, the, there's gonna be a larger proportion of children that are being born to aged parents, right? So yes, this is extraordinarily important for female uh, general health, but when we're talking about this, this impacts every single human on the planet, right? Because mm -hmm. you can't develop without exposure to these tissues. You're, if you're uh, if your mother is undergoing, you know, systemic aging in her environment and uh, she's pregnant and is, is you know, growing in the next uh, life, it's, it's what are the impacts of that environmental exposure to the development of these cells, to the development of this next organism? And so really this is, it has impacts beyond the female. This impacts both men and women. And we are really, you know, this is a global question. It, it goes beyond the lifespan of the female and to future generations as well. So that's one of our focuses um, in reproductive aging science is not only how, how does aging impact the individual, but how does it impact generations down the line? So I wanted mm -hmm. to put that little plug in. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, well, we've been, uh, we've been talking a lot about the field and where it was and where it is now. And we haven't even gotten to the topic that we were going to talk about, which is, uh, which is, you know, focused around research projects that are happening in the hub and research pro projects that are happening in the Duncan lab. So um, while I have you on camera and you can't say no, I think, um, I think we will definitely have an OVA hour going forward that will bring us back to talk about that stuff. And we'll bring on some of the people that you're collaborating with, I think, if that's okay with you. Um, to talk about the science, because I think the idea, you know, of course, we know that there's intrinsic factors in the egg and in, you know, in the, in the ovary that are functioning during aging and that are important for, you know, determining the number and quality of eggs over time. But there, there is this incredibly important component of the environment, and that could mean the environment, you know, outside of the woman, but also the environment, you know, around the egg, which I think is the topic of a lot of the work that you both do. Um, so 
if you guys don't mind, because we have some questions and I don't want to, I'd like to try to answer some of them, but um, just to wrap up our discussion here, um, Francesca, your postdoctoral fellow, uh, Farnes, was a recipient of one of the inaugural GCRLE grants. So uh, we split up the granting into multiple categories because we wanted to try to attract as many as many creative people as we could. And we wanted to cast a wide net. And so we awarded grants to very senior scientists who've had their labs for a long time. We awarded grants to junior PIs who are just starting their labs. Um, we awarded grants to postdoctoral fellows uh, because we want to basically grow the field. And so we're trying to bring in you know, the most creative junior people to, to think about these questions. And then we also awarded some pilot grants, which would be for anyone who had an idea that might not be funded by a, an institution like the NIH. So um, Farnes successfully competed. It was a very competitive pool and won this award to support her work. Can you tell us a little bit about her research? Yeah, so I, um, so speaking of the environment, so when I started my lab, as I said, I had originally been studying, you know, what happens inside the egg with aging. And as I started my own independent lab, I started thinking about that environment. So the egg develops in an ovary and the ovary is a really complicated environment complex with a lot of cell types and components. Um, and as Jules mentions, it's even more complicated than that because the ovary is growing within and developing within the complex of a systemic individual that's also aging. Um, and so when Farnes joined my lab, we had made this really exciting discovery that the environment in which the eggs are developing um, become fibrotic. So they accumulate um, collagen and they become really stiff. And you can actually tell uh, young and old ovary by just touching them because it takes more to push down on an old ovary, more force to push down on an old ovary compared to a young ovary. And the young ovary is also really inflammatory. And so we often mm -hmm. think about aging tissues as being stiff and inflammatory. But again, remember that um, this is happening in the ovary much earlier than these other aging organ systems. And so we had made these observations and part of the lab is trying to figure out the mechanisms that underlie these observations. But at the same time that we were doing this, we wanted to start thinking how we could address this therapeutically. So if we deliver um, an anti-inflammatory agent or an anti-fibrotic agent that are FDA approved and used for fibrosis and inflammation in other organ systems, if we gave this to an aging animal, either systemically, so throughout their entire body, or targeted to the ovary with a catheter, could we actually improve reproductive outcomes? Mm -hmm. And I think this type of science is critical, right? If we're gonna go from bench to bedside, we have to have preclinical models, we have to be able to test uh, the therapeutic value, but some, most I think funding agencies would say you're putting the cart before the horse, um, if you don't have a mechanism, a specific mechanism. And so what we said is we can't wait that long, right? Mm -hmm. We wanna kind of get to a therapeutic endpoint much faster. And so Farnes put together a proposal for the GCRLE um, to develop a preclinical pipeline where she could deliver antifibrotics or anti-inflammatory um, agents to an aging mouse, a reproductive aged mouse, and see if she can extend not only reproductive parameters, but also the general health parameters um, of that animal. And so we are so excited that she was funded to do this research. Um, and she has some super exciting um, data showing that she can in fact deliver um, these, these agents directly to the ovary. And so now she's actually doing the experiment after proof of concept that she can do these deliveries in an animal model um, and now looking at those reproductive um, and general health outcomes. And, you know, she's used this, she's early in her career, she wants to be an independent investigator. And so the impact, not only on just understanding mechanisms and, and therapeutic targets for reproductive longevity, but to invest in the next generation of researchers. So she wants to run her own lab. This is really a demonstration that she can seek and secure independent funding and execute a project. And she's used this as a foundation to apply for independent funding or transition funding through the NIH so that she can start her own lab. And I think without support mechanisms such as this, like this trajectory is a lot harder. And so we're extremely grateful, again, from the science side, um, but also from the training perspective of what these types of grants for the GCRLE um, have enabled. So super grateful and I'm, I'm really excited. And I think, you know, being on the, the committee 
um, that was involved in looking at the grant applications, I think one of the most exciting things is seeing that it's science from the foundational mechanisms all the way to translation and it's all over the world. Um, and it's looking at all different model organisms from, you know, worms to humans. And I think that kind and of- rotifers. I think we had an application yeah. on rotifers too. Yeah. So I think that just the perspectives and again, the thinking outside of the box and being open-minded is going to catalyze, you know, again, like I said, centuries of ideas um, to follow up on. Yeah. Super exciting. Um, Jules, I have one last question that I'll pitch to you, which is um, as someone who's in the middle of their training, um, mm -hmm. this certainly is not an end point for you, right? We're, we're going to keep you for as long as we can, but at some point you will move on because you have a, a very illustrious career to build. Um, what are you up to after this or what's happening right now in terms of, you know, your career? Sure. Um, so right now I, uh, I operate the hub, which has been this like fantastic sort of example of what collaboration across fields can be. And, you know, my passion is, of course, reproductive aging. I love that I come from this background of reproduction and this sort of lens and view of aging. It sort of, it, it expands every single question you can ask within this system. And so for me, when I look, you know, five years, 10 years down the line, I absolutely see myself, you know, continuing to support this effort and, and, you know, hopefully myself can follow in Francesca's uh, footsteps and be a pioneer in reproductive aging as well. So um, I think you will be seeing me staying in academic uh, research and science for the uh, future. And I hope to, you know, again, follow in the, in the footsteps of Farnes as well um, in terms of securing my own funding and, and launching my own research uh, that has to do with reproductive aging. So that's really awesome. exciting. <laughs> yeah, this is an area, I mean, this is a topic that we haven't really covered, and especially since the audience here is, is, is mostly not scientists, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important to give people to give people a window into how science training works, because it's, mm -hmm. it's a huge black box to most people. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what you, what you do. Um, you. All right, so we have a couple of questions. We have like two or three minutes left. Um, I am going to ask a few questions. And I will say um, there will be a link in the chat um, if it's not already there for how you can stay connected to us. Um, obviously you can find us on the web um, and this will, this and other over hours are posted on a YouTube channel there. Um, in terms of continuing this discussion, because uh, you know, there's more questions than we could possibly get to. Uh, we, if you want to continue the discussion, we'll go over to gcrelay.org and open a discussion thread there. And you can ask questions, you know, over the next days and weeks and months. And hopefully there'll be a whole community of people who want to chat. Um, so let's see. Uh, what are the center and consortium doing to expand their mission globally? Oh, oh. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to just very quickly say that, um, in addition to funding grants to scientists all over the world, um, Francesca and I actually with uh, Yushin Su, who is a reproductive aging scientist at Columbia University, um, we are co-organizing a conference, the very first conference, international conference on reproductive aging. That's gonna take place in uh, June in Palm Springs. And we hope that this will become a really important meeting for the field going forward. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and Jennifer, separately, I just, wanna, mm -hmm. um, I just wanna mention that I think this, you know, to emphasize that this is really a first meeting of its kind. So, mm -hmm. you know, traditionally, if, if at all, reproductive aging was covered as one session in a much larger, you know, reproductive science focused meeting. Um, and I'm not sure that reproductive science is even covered at all in aging meetings. And so to fa the fact that there's a standalone meeting that is going to take place over the course of a week, I think just talks about the testimony of how important this field is. Um, and this, this conference is, again, I think going to launch us into new areas. Yeah. And hopefully attract a lot more people um, to, to think about this as a, as a really important uh, area to work on. Um, Beyond that, uh, we have planted a second center. So there's a center at the National University of Singapore, the Asia Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. And I hope that those will continue to uh, be seated all over the world. 
Um, and we're about to launch another round of granting, which I think, and we'll do, we skipped a year because of the pandemic, but we'll, we'll do a, a round of grants every year going forward. And, um, you know, we'll continue to, to try to bridge the gap between all these different stakeholders. So you and the audience are an important stakeholder. You are our ambassadors. So as much as you can spread the word about this being an important problem, but also just tell people what we're doing, just to shine more light on this area of science, but also just this area of, of women's health and, um, and well-being. So with that, uh, I think we've completely run out of time, but thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Jules, so much for being here. And um, I'm definitely going to grab your collaborators to talk about science. And hopefully, if you don't mind, you'll, you could come back and tell us a little bit more about the, the work that you're doing, because um, I think it's really fascinating and, and everyone wants to hear about it. <laughs> Absolutely. We're happy to join. Okay, great. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having us.